Hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Viney <laughs> Smith, and I want to uh, welcome you to the uh, Bonner History Roundtable, which are occasional uh, gatherings of people in Bonner, Milltown, and the communities to gather the history of the area and, and uh, try and keep it from disappearing. Um, I'm sure many of you have been to some of the other ones that uh, Kim Brigham organized on the, the streetcar and the baseball and various other uh, topics. And today, um, we're going to talk about the mill, and it's wonderful to see so many people here who I'm sure have endless stories that, that can help us preserve some of that history. Um, so uh, we're going to um, talk about the mill in terms of the various departments and we probably won't um, you know we, we may I'm sure we'll have more information than we have time for today but we're going to have a second uh, meeting in February on the 25th the, it's the last the last Sunday in February um, so I'm gonna, Judy I wonder if you could say a few words about the people who've helped put this together the Yes, as you uh, know, if you've been coming, Paul Layton was uh, one of the instigators of um, the round table, and it's a very informal group. We have no um, officers, we have no budget, we have no rules, we just do what we want to do. And uh, so then when we want to do a program like this, we're thinking, well, how are we going to put it together? And we have some very generous uh, donors, and I'm going to try to um, Miney warned me of this and then I forgot to bring my list up here with me, but we had many people who have donated materials and money so that we can uh, bring this together and and hopefully have another session next month. And I'm gonna uh, try to remember these off the top of my head, Bonner School, the Friends of Two Rivers, the Missoula Community Access Television is here filming this so that we will have a permanent record and it will also be shown on TV and we'll try to let you know when those times will be when we find them out. Uh, the Montana Department of Environmental Quality sent some information. The um, Missoula Rural Fire District as well. And um, then just many people who care so much about this community and about this subject have uh, all been so generous, so thank you very much. Thanks, Judy, and um, of course, thank the church for hosting us here. And um, I took your microphone. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I can move to it. I'm not used to this. <laughs> uh, and now, um, Jim Willis is going to introduce the speakers and explain how they're the uh, sort of organization. Uh, first, of all, first, we're going to have Cal Bonnet. Uh, he's going to be speaking about the oh, lamb plant, uh, box factory, house plant, and the sawmill. And um, Rudy Miller, he worked in the planer as a grader. Yes. And then we'll have Art Bailey, and he worked uh, for Timberlands and also uh, uh, out in the log yard. And then Glenn Smith's going to finish it off, and he'll talk about a very large uh, about Bonner growing up in Bonner and and the mill and all the jobs he had so we'll ask Cal to start out okay uh, I guess to start with I started uh, work for the Anaconda company excuse me I started to work for the Anaconda company in uh, September of 1960 right, right after I got out of the army and my first assignment was in the box factory which in later years it became the warehouse my first job was piling two by fours that were being made through a machine that was called a finger joiner. <coughs> the machine would make a two by four, eight foot boards from short pieces of material that was salvaged from two by fours that had no commercial value. And so they, we would, uh, they would cut them up and we'd pass them through this machine. They could be anywhere from 10 inches long to several feet in length. The pieces would pass through cutters that would put uh, finger joints on the end of each piece. <coughs> and uh, then they would proceed on and after they had the groove, tongue and groove cut on the end of each piece, they would proceed on to another machine that would uh, put glue in them joints. And once the glue was in the joints, then they would run to another set of rolls that would 
force them together so the joints would be real night you know tight bond in the joints and uh, from that point they'd go on to uh, cut off saw to cut them to the proper length because it was just one continuous board all the time and you go to cut off saw to get them to the proper length and then they would pass through an oven and they had to be baked because this was a fast process and you and that glue had to have time to cure otherwise the boards would just fall apart because the glue couldn't hold it so they went through the oven and they were baked and uh, then they'd come out of there and, and uh, I, I was the guy stacking it. Uh, my salary when I started was $1.97 an hour. The whole purpose of the box factory was to salvage products that could be made from low grade material that had of little value. Products that were made included several types and sizes of am ammunition boxes for the military, an assortment of different boxes for fruits and vegetables, lath, fence pickets, survey stakes, hub stakes for the state highway department. We also made wooden ladders for the Butte uh, copper mines and made fur and large wooden blocks that were about three inches by 12 inches by 24 inches long with a quarter inch and a quarter hole drilled in the center for a rock bolt. The miners in Butte would drill a hole into the ceiling of a tunnel and install a rock bolt and then put this wooden block on the bolt and put a washer and nut on it and screw it to the ceiling and that would prevent cave-ins and, and rocks falling out of ceilings in the mines. So we made them and that was, you know, didn't help people wouldn't get hurt that way. We also made uh, cable reels for the facility in Black Eagle, Anaconda's facility in Black Eagle, and that was a wire making facility. And so we made the reels for them to roll that wire on. Making cable reels was, was quite a process. The reels were up to four feet in diameter when finished. Making them involved positioning the layer boards in one direction, like, you know, layer boards this way, and then you'd have to put another layer of boards 90 degrees to that. These layers were then hand nailed all the way around except for the center 16 inches. The nails were long enough to penetrate both layers of board and protrude out the bottom side about a quarter to three eighths of an inch. Once nailed up, the pieces were drilled with a hole in the center and hand carried to a set of rollers that would, the piece would have to pass through. And as the piece passed through, these rolls would bend over them nails so there was no sharp nails sticking out the other side. They would then be uh, hand carried to a bandsaw, and the bandsaw had a little center piece on it that was a proper diameter from the saw, and they, that center hole we drilled in that before we put it into rollers, we'd put it on that center, that center plug, and rotate it in the bandsaw, and that's how we'd cut the circle out. And then from there, it would go over to a, a router table, and it would have just a regular router, and it would cut a groove around that center inches where we didn't put that any nails and it cut a groove around there, and that's where they put the staves in the, you, know, you see the center of the cable reels, how they are folded together, and it just was the middle portion of the, of the reels. The nails were a special nail. They were a 16 penny with a duck bill point, and it, just like the name implies, it was kind of shaped like the, the bill of a duck, and, uh, and a needle to make them soft so they would bend over easily. Annealing caused a problem with nails being easily bent when being driven with a hammer because they were so soft. When making cable reels was our assignment, it would get pretty boring driving nails all day long. So we'd have contests of who could drive a 16 penny nail in two strokes with the hammer. <laughs> in order to accomplish this, a person would have a better chance of driving the nail in two strokes if you could hit the nail with your first blow about half, a third to halfway in. <laughs> Needless to say, our fingers were pretty bruised because, you know, <laughs> not all the time you were hitting, them, hitting all these nails. <coughs> the planers and the molding machines at, were located right beside the box factory on, on the, the north side of the, of the warehouse, where, where the old warehouse, well, where the box factory was. And with, later years became the warehouse. This is the area where we would pick up low-grade lumber and take it into the box factory for processing into the products that I mentioned. 
We would load the lumber by hand on the carts and take them upstairs by elevator to the cut-up area. During this period, uh, the large building was starting to be constructed to house the new planer lines that were stalled to replace the old planers north of the box <coughs> factory. The new planers and supporting equipment was state-of-the-art for that time period. Once the old planers were removed, that location was used to install equipment to process lumber into molding stock of, mul of a multitude of different sizes. Also, a new hammer hog was installed and waste material was, was processed into fuel for the boilers to produce steam. After the new planers were up and running for a period of time, it was decided that a new lumber processing plant was needed due to the decreased need for wood products from the Butte mines. On the west side of the old planer, a new precision edger was installed along with chop saws, scrap conveyors, and, and sorting tables. Most of the products that were made were door jam material, window, window making material, and molding stock. We still produced some survey stakes, hub stakes, and lath. The Butte Underground Mines production was slowing down to the increase in production from the Berkeley pit. As time went by, there was less and less need for mine ladders and rock bolts that we supplied. So finally, the old box factory was just kind of come to the end of its life and it was dismantled and that was kind of the end of the box factory. So as it happened, the maintenance and mach machine setup person that worked in the beam laminating plant was going to leave for other opportunities. I was able to re replace that person. By taking that job, I learned firsthand how to make, how beams were made and how machines had to be maintained to make a quality laminated beam. I also ma main started maintaining all power hand tools, sharpening band saws and maintaining the beam planer and scarfing machine and how to use welding and cutting machines. In the scarfing machine, I don't know if you see laminated beams, that was the machine that would put the slant on the end of the board so they'd fit them together when they'd make the beams. <coughs> In addition to making beams, complete houses were being made along with roof panels and floor panels and, and prefabricated houses also. You could, you could buy a prefabricated house or if you wanted a, a complete, like a trailer house, made right there on the spot, we made them. <coughs> I was in a beam plant, uh, house plant department until Anaconda sold out to U.S. Plywood and that was in the spring of 72. We were all laid off for, after the sale and I went to work for a welding and spring making company in Missoula. I worked for them all summer I installed the stairways and all the railings outside of each room for the Edgewater Motel. I never liked that job, but I had a family to support, so I stuck with it. That summer, U.S. Plywood purchased all of Anaconda Timberlands and the Bonner Sawmill Complex with the plan to start the sawmill complex back up sometime after Labor Day. I received a call from one of the persons that took over the machine shop and asked if I would consider going into the sawmill as a lead millwright. The pay was $1.25 an hour less than what I was making at the time. Like I said, I never liked that job, so it didn't take me long to decide, heck yeah, I'll take that job. So, so began my association with the sawmill. Our first assignment was to repair whatever was necessary to get the operation up and running. One of my first jobs was to get the debarker ready to go. This was the first time I was around or even saw this type of machinery. The debarker operate on water pressure. And I see there's a picture of a debarker here, but this one here wasn't the same one that, I must have been at a later date as a different one was put in. The pressure water came out of nozzles that were on oscillating arms on, <coughs> excuse me, on each side of the conveyor. And these arms, the log would pass through when these arms are sitting here like this, and just oscillating up and down, just taking the bark right <coughs> off of them logs. If you stop the log under there, and left it there long enough, it would just eventually cut the log in half. There was just so much pressure on that water. <coughs> so then the log, after it came through, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> came through the conveyor, it'd pass, go on past, out of, come out of the debarker, and then it would pass a, a saw that was about 10 feet in diameter. When the log would get past the saw to the proper length, the clamps would come up and clamp onto the log, stop it, it's moving on the conveyor, the saw would be activated and would cut the log off. The clamps holding the log were released, then kick, 
kickers would kick the log off the conveyor into the hot pond. To, to remove bark would travel to, in a conveyor to a hog that was, would pulverize the bark into small pieces. The small bark was then travel to another conveyor to a bark press where the water in the bark was squeezed out of it. When this operation was complete, the processed bark would then be transferred to what was referred to as a serpentine belt. This belt would transfer the bark to the boilers where it was burned to create steam and operate various machines in the sawmill. This system was used until the new log processor was completed west of the plywood plant. Now to return to the logs that were debarked. After the log was kicked off the debarker conveyor and into the hot pond, it would be maneuvered to the conveyor that was referred to as the bull chain. Logs were floated on this conveyor and would be conveyed into the sawmill for processing. The conveyor went from below pond level and would rise about 20 feet or so to the sawmill level. Once the log was maneuvered to the bull chain, the log was transported up into the sawmill building. When the log would enter the saw the sawmill, the operator would determine to which carriage the log should go for processing. Later, we installed an electronic scanner to determine the length of the log diameter and log volume and board feet using the Scrivener scale. <coughs> Scrivener scale was the log measure procedure used to determine the amount of board feet in the log. This new type of electronics was our first introduction to the computer area, era. We had three carriages. The west side carriage, also referred to as the long side, it could handle the longest and largest diameter logs. The middle carriage <coughs> could handle most logs ex except if they were too long or too large in diameter. And the east side carriage, referred to as the short side, would process the shorter and smaller logs. The logs were powered by steam cylinders connected to the carriages. The steam cylinders re were referred to as shotguns. The steam cylinders were about 10 to 12 inches in diameter, diameter and 30 or 40 feet long. And I've got some pictures of some barrels off of them shotguns back there when we repaired them one time so you get an idea what I'm talking about, what they looked like. The, the carriages were the main processing machines. The carriages were used to set the log to the thickness that the sawyer wanted and transport it through the bandsaw to make the desired cut. When the log was loaded onto the carriage, the sawyer would position the log on the carriage to achieve the best opening face for that log. To, to position the log where he wanted it, he had a steam-operated log turner that was used to roll the log and push the log against the blocks of the carriage. The first pass would open the log with a thin cut and create a slab. The slab would pass down a conveyor and was transferred to a set of floor chains that would eventually move the slabs to a chipper. The next pass would take a cut the thickness of the board. The piece would then be, the piece would be proper thickness, but the edges would be rounded from the curvature of the log. These pieces would be conveyed to an edger. The edger would cut the width of the board into whatever width could be made, four inch, six inch, eight inch, 10 inch, or 12 inch. On the next pass, the sawyer would turn the log on the carriage about 90 degrees or 180, and, depend on, and start the process all over again. The sawyer would keep cutting on the log until it was down to the size that could be passed through the gang saw. This squared up the centerpiece. This squared up centerpiece was referred to as a cant. The cant side would size would be in multiples of two inches. Cant size could be anywhere from four inches, four by four inches up to twelve by thirty inches in width and up to twenty feet long. The gang saw had a multitude of saws in it and would oscillate up and down just like a handsaw, only it was powered and it had a multitude of saws, each one two inches apart. And so they'd feed this can into that thing and it would sit there and just make pieces out of them. And if you, you put a can in there, like say it was 12 inches by 18 inches, the saws would cut the can into nine two by 12 boards. And so nine, nine boards would come off the back side of it. The gang saw was later replaced with a set of twin band saws that was used to cut the can into the de desired thickness. The boards coming out of the edgers and the gang saw, the gang saw would proceed to a transfer table and be transported to trim saws. The function of the trim saw was to cut the boards to length that would produce a quality board. Once a board passed through the trim saw, they went on a long transfer train, chain called the green chain. The boards were stored and stacked according to, stacked according to wood species, thickness, width, length, and grade. The green chain was replaced with a 50-bin sorter, which was a computerized 
green chain. From the green chain, the boards went into a stacker, which was a sh machine that would put down a layer of boards about nine feet wide. It had a couple arms on it to go under. They'd put, it pick up a layer of boards and it would transport them out to, to the stack and it would dump the boards, the arms would pull back and there was a stop, it pulled the boards off and they'd lay there on that stack. Then there was stickers that came out and they would put three or four stickers on the length of the load. And the purpose of the stickers was that they had to leave the air space in between each layer because as the boards would pass through the dry kiln, they would need the air flow through there to, you know, so they could get the boards dry to the proper proper moisture content, which I'm sure Rudy will probably mention what that was, what was required. Uh, then from there they went, uh, they were put on kiln buggies, dry kiln buggies, which were nothing more than carts that run on small railroad type tracks. When the carts were full, they were transferred into the dry, dry kiln. They were left in the kilns until the lumber was dried to the required moisture content. The heat source for the dry kilns was steam heat that was generated by the boilers. The s boilers burned the bark and sawmill sawdust to produce steam. Steam was used to operate log kickers, log loaders, log turners, and our shotguns. Also, they used steam to supply the heat to the Bonner houses for a long period of time. The, the lumber exiting the dry kilns was stored in the outfeed side of the kilns. This was the cool down area where the stacks of lumber would cool down to ambient temperature. Prior to constructing the new planer, the new planer building and the new planer lines, the stacks of lumbers would go to a lumber unstacker. The stickers were recaptured to be recycled again at the stacker. The lumber was transferred to a dry chain and restacked on the hand on the buggies, on, on bunks, I mean. Excuse me, on the bunks. Bunks were somewhat like a pallet. They were fabricated for straddle buggies. And the straddle buggy, once you had a load, you'd come over and straddle the load, pick it up, and you'd haul that load back around over to the planers. And then from there, the planers would, would uh, process it. <coughs> After exiting the planer, the plane lumber would be either stored outside under covers or kept to, to keep the lumber dry or stored in what we called stand-up sheds to keep the boards from warping or go to shipping where it was hand stacked in the railroad boxcars, depending on what the order required for shipping. The lumber was placed in at the box in the boxcars with two man crews that would use the would stack the lumber in the boxcars. Some lumber was also loaded on trucks with a forklift. Once the new planers were up and running, the old dry chain was no longer needed and removed. The process of unstacking and recapturing stickers remained basically the same, but instead of going to the dry chain, the lumber was transferred to a chain that took the lumber directly to the planer. There were two of these transfer chains, one for each planer. Lumber was put in boxcars with forklift and lumber was transferred inside the building with overhead cranes. This system of processing lumber remained until the Salma was shut down to build a new mill, new stud mill and planing mill. The sawmill planer was shut down in 1988. The reason the sawmill was shut down was that the old carriage system was becoming inefficient at handling the logs as they were getting smaller. The new plywood plant that was constructed was using the larger and higher quality lo logs to make plywood. That left the sawmill with a smaller and lower quality log. There are plenty of small logs that required a different type of processing. The criteria for a new mill was to utilize state-of-the-art computers to control scanning optimization, volume, recovery, and minimize manpower to operate the new mill, and to utilize the smaller logs that are available. The machinery that was selected was a Nicholson debarker, Kokum's can car double-end dogger, and uh, Kokum's can car band saws, horizontal band saws, Sherman edger, Ukiah edger, and the, the chipper and hog that was required to, for the supporting equipment. And that's where I ended it. I didn't go into after the sawmill remodel. Thank so that, that was up until 1990 when we started back up. Cal, could you uh, pull the map here? Where the, where the sawmill was? Sure. And the purpose of this for TV, so people in Missoula won't know. <laughs> well, here, here's the big buildings. 
the big uh, building beside the highway. And so you go go north up up river, and right in here it's a sawmill. We had the sawmill sitting here, powerhouse sitting here, the boiler sitting here is where the boilers were at. The warehouse is sitting here, and then then here was when I told you when they was come out onto the green chain. This is where the old green chain used to run. Is right here, and eventually put that new sorter in. He he went in right here. And then, then this was the green storage area and the stacker area, the dry kill and the whole works from, from on there. Well, thank you. Okay, Rudy, would you like to? Yeah. Well, I'm Rudy Miller and I started in 1962, the 22nd of January. It's kind of something how I got the job. Couldn't find anything in Missoula and they had on the radio that they were looking for lumber workers out at the Anaconda Mill at Bonner. It was about 20 below in Missoula, so I went to the employment office and they gave me a little yellow card and take this out there. Took it out there and I thought, I gotta be crazy. I couldn't hardly take the cold getting from my car down there. When I got down there, why, Mr. Riley was there and he said, yes, I'll hire you. Not too many questions. He said, do you want to work in the, on the green chain or do you want to work in the planer? And I figured, I'd been around planers and they had doors on them and they weren't that cold, so. I said, I'll take the planner. <laughs> when I got the, so I got the job and started in, and it was 20 below in Missoula, and it was 30 below out here the day I started. I thought, well, this is just, so I was, they put me to tying lumber, the coldest job you could have. They split a one, one by four and a half, then you had to tie it all back together again. And in about every 30 minutes, you ran in, try to warm your hands up on a steam pipe. So that went on for probably three weeks and it slowly started warming up. When I got to, then I kept thinking if I could just get a job that was more physical, I could stay a lot warmer. Well, by that time it was spring, so I eventually I started stacking lumber. And I kept looking at these graders. That looked like a heck of an easier job. Turn it over, put a mark on it, let it go by. So when an opening came about 15 months later, I went into grading because they had then built the new building there and they needed a lot of graders. So I graded over there for the rest of my career. But when they, that was a good place to grade. It had a nice table, you had a lot of lights and they had heat in there. So we went from there to, then they sold out and that was really panic in 72. And, but I lucked out when I got called back, why I had a seniority date of a number 60 instead of 600. So I was able to work a lot of overtime and everything. But what I did there, I graded lumber, and that was after coming through the sawmill, like Kel says, well, it was dried and then it came to us and we had to decide what grade to put on it or to cut off two feet or four feet and get a better grade. Then that would go into stackers and they uh, put it in nice packs and sent off to shipping. So although it sounds like a monotonous job, it really wasn't because each board kind of had its own character. Then U.S. Plywood, they didn't want to grade any of this lumber outside. They ran it through the planer. So then that really put a thing. It took three graders in the line. You had a stick in your hand and you had to figure out the recovery rate value of each piece about as fast as I'm saying it, mark it, and it'd go on down the line. So. That went along like that for years. It was a good job. And then Stimson Lumber came along, and they uh, all we had on them was just studs. It was grading 60 studs a minute, which is pretty, I thought was pretty fast. And eventually that went up to 80 studs a minute, and I finally retired from that. But uh, it was a good job. It, uh, I raised my family there and part of my grandkids, and it, uh, it's, I guess that's all I got to say on that. Thank you. Well, I'm Art Bailey. Uh, started there in 64, and, and I've got to apologize a little bit for being here today unprepared. Uh, I really didn't know what the subject was gonna to be today. and. Uh, so I came unprepared, and I'm going to shoot from the hip a little bit, which is not all that bad because uh, Clint Eastwood did that for years and got by with it. So. 
Um, <clears throat> also, I'm kind of honored to be here today and offended at the same time. Uh, it's good to see a lot of the faces that I know and, and be back again with family. And um, it's always an honor if you can work with the, this, this group out here. They've always been a very wonderful group. I'm a little bit offended by it. Um, we're talking about history today, and of course that throws me in with the old timers, and I don't know <laughs> if I can accept that. So, I got, I got to uh, bring something in that maybe really doesn't fit in this picture, but I want to. I come into this plant at a very, very unique time frame, in that I was hired on when uh, the majority of the old timers and the people that really knew the mill were about to retire or moving on. And those people took me under my, their wing and, and carried me through those times and taught me the trade, taught me their trades. And of course, a lot of stories went on, storytelling, but they were a wonderful, wonderful, hardworking people that you just couldn't help but to love. And I, and I cherish those thoughts as I will until I die. They were wonderful people, and I know a lot of you here had grandfathers that worked there. I did. As a matter of fact, both my grandfathers worked there. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you do, too. So it was, it was a really a, a unique time, and I, I really cherish that. A lot of the old timers, uh, I started out in the uh, logging industry. Uh, at that time, Timberlands had their own uh, logging industry, and, and we used to sit around in the wintertime and build a little campfire and sit on blocks of wood and, of course, reminisce, and, and the old timers always had stories to tell. And, and I come to find out in a hurry that, that lumbermen and loggers really weren't that much different, and that this guy would tell you that he caught a fish yesterday that weighed a pound, and this guy caught one that weighed two pounds. And the lumbermen were the same way. It, the stories got stressed. But it was a good time. Um, I started out in 1964 in the logging uh, Timberlands. And Timberlands at that time, uh, Anaconda, had their own uh, logging crews, and which consisted of a crew boss, um, shovel operators, uh, a loading operator, crane operator to load the logs onto the trucks, the truck drivers, of course, skidder operators, choker setters, sawyers. Um, I hope I haven't left anybody out. But um, that was kind of a good time for me. I learned a lot and, and a lot of wonderful, wonderful people to work with. The, um, I didn't last long in the woods. I was, uh, at that time, we were doing a lot of the log sorting on landing, so to speak, and landings took a lot of room and a lot of space and damaged a lot of, of the ground area. So in order to um, get away from that, they, the, the plant decided that they would do most of their sorting on the plant site rather than to do it in the woods and get away with these, from these big landings. And I was transferred down to the uh, log yard area. And in the log yard area, we started sorting uh, uh, by species and by size uh, the de for the demands of the mills, whatever they were operating, and, and really what was uh, selling on the market that, at that time. Well, that's how I got started uh, in the mill. Um, we, we did do several jobs uh, other than that out, and I, I guess I forgot forcers that were also working in there, and also some of the tree planting. And that's tree planting, I want to touch on that just a little bit. That's kind of a misconception in the world today. We did a lot of tree planting, but that's really not what we really needed. What we really needed to do was more thinning. When you, when you leave the seed trees in the woods that, that we did, the trees would come up uh, a lot thicker than uh, you would expect, and you really needed to be concentrating more on thinning than planting. We did, however, plant some of the the more harsh uh, environment um, on the south slopes, mainly where there was uh, less water. So I came into the mill and, and sorted logs, and at that time, of course, we were using the pond area to feed the, the mills. 
And actually, we've had both mills, as Cal said, when, and uh, came through the water debarkers, through the pond, through the water debarkers, and uh, done some sorting in that area. As uh, the larger logs would go into the sawmill area, and the smaller logs would be sorted out to go into the stud mill area. Uh, I spent many, many hours uh, on that pond. Uh, the cleanup on that was almost inevitable. Every weekend, you were going to be cleaning the pond. It was uh, from the leftover bark that the chains didn't pick up would eventually end up in the pond and you'd have to keep continuously clean that out. That fuel was then dried out and used for hog fuel to burn into the boilers later. Um, later on, it, uh, uh, the plywood plant, of course, came in. And of course, that has to be one of the biggest uh, things that happened in the mill in my time, and probably in everybody's time, was the plywood plant. I, I left out a part here. I've got to go back to these crew bosses in the woods. Crew bosses. That's a four-letter word. <laughs> you don't call them bosses, <laughs> although we did. And uh, later on, that became a supervisor job. Now you were a supervisor. That came with a big title, but no more pay and no less responsibility. But uh, that changed over time. You very seldom hear of in any of the industries. Bosses, you don't have bosses anymore. I have one at home, but <laughs> <laughs> you, don't really, you don't really hear that language. I guess the other two things that, that uh, I really wanted to touch on was, that changed for me over my time period was, one, when I first started, there was very, I, I don't even remember, there was very few women that worked in the plant site very few. Most of the women of that era were uh, office help. Very, very, uh, very small majority. And in fact, I don't even think there was, any, there was no women in the, in the logging area that I know of, and, and very few in the plant site. Later on, however, that changed and changed dramatically as time went on and, and uh, a kind of a new generation, so to speak, came in. and, and, and there was a lot of women that came into the plant site and worked side by side with a lot of, a lot of wonderful people, a lot of good, hardworking people. So, and the other thing that changed over my time frame, which was kind of hard to uh, accept, I guess, because we're creatures of habit. If we go to church, we sit in the same chair. We, went, we did that when we went to school. So it's accepting change is kind of hard for all of us. But one thing that changed over the years, over the 40 years of my time, was safety. And safety became a big, big issue. Uh, lots of rules and regulations came down from the government and the states, and, uh, and it was for the better. It was, it was really for the better. When I started out in logging in 64, they threw you a hard hat and said, go to work. That was, that was your training period and you better not be late. After that time frame, we got into a lot of safety issues and safety meetings and safety regulations, eye protection, hearing protection, fall protection. It just goes on and on and on. And I, I got to say that I think that was probably for the better, a lot less accidents over the years, and especially a lot less serious accidents. So well, that's kind of where I started and where I ended up. I, we sorted logs in the plywood plant, and uh, I, eventually I worked up into a supervisor's position. I had a crew of about 20 men, and very good workers, and uh, we would sort by species, by size. Uh, by that time, the new stud mill had been in place, and we were sorting for the stud mill, uh, 14 inches and down for that size. and. Um, over that was into the plywood, and we actually had uh, a couple head rigs running at that time, too. So uh, pine was not really a, a one of the better uh, wood products to put into the plywood. And also, it drew a little better price. Uh, depending on the markets, we would take the better pine and send it, unlike what Cal said, the, the sawmill got the best of the pine because that was uh, high-priced commodities. And the, the plywood was uh, actually better with the fir and the larches. I think at one time we had 14 sorts in the mill from uh, 
the Ponderosa Pines to the, the Doug Fir to uh, Western Larch to uh, some of the spruces. Cedars we sorted out. Um, we did not cut a lot of cedar, although there was some cedar that got slipped through the mill once in, on occasion. And of course, when I got down to the to Rudy here, uh, they cabbaged onto that because that was a kind of a high commodity, and they'd like take that home. So that's kind of where that's where that ended up in Rudy's house. Buy it for number four. Yeah, because they were grading it, so they would call it out. Uh, we didn't get a lot of cedar, it was kind of a byproduct. And speaking of byproducts, there was a lot of products and a lot of product mixes over the years. Uh, for one thing, it was shavings, which we sold to, to the plant uh, in Missoula there. And uh, the, of course, the chips that went to the pulp mill. And uh, hog, fuel, hog fuel became a big issue later on in, in my time. It was hard to keep up with the hog fuel that run the boilers. And actually, uh, stones boiler as well. Um, the the um, operation took about 20 people, and and I, another big change that came along in that time was the big Wagners and the big the big uh, equipment that we had. Uh, it was a lot safer to handle these loads. We could we could run up to a load and and pick off a load with uh, a whole load without any problem. So that was a lot safer. At one time, uh, during that operation, we were unloading a truck every four minutes. It took 300 loads of logs when the ply was at, was at max to keep that mill operating. Uh, it's a lot of wood, a lot of handling, and uh, a lot of material. And that, of course, diminished as time went on. Is that per day? Per day. 300 logs per day actually over a million board feet per year, or excuse me, 400 million board feet per year <clears throat> went through that mill. And that included the sawmill and the uh, stud mill and, and the plywood plant. A lot of different mixes over the years, and, and not all of them in my time. Uh, they were taking the molders out as I went in. I, these fellows could probably tell you about that. Uh, the beam plant, my grandfather worked in the beam plant. Um, the trailer house factory, a lot of people probably forgot about that. That was kind of a flop, mm -hmm. but, but it, it was tried. Yeah, they tried it. Um, a lot of different mixes, a lot of different products over the years. And, and it was just a, it was a wonderful time, a wonderful job, and a lot of very wonderful, wonderful people to work with. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm next up. My name is Glenn Smith. And uh, boy, our other speakers here have pretty well covered the operation of the mill. So I'm just going to highlight on some of their their things. I've got some neat <coughs> little anecdotes here that can go along with that. When I first came to the Bonner area, it was in the late 1940s. And we came in with, uh, my mother had a habit of, of changing husbands about like some guys that change your socks. <laughs> so I had a variety of stepdads. This particular stepdad in the late 40s was named Thomas Headley. He was in charge of the steam locomotives that pulled the logs down <coughs> from the Blackfoot. The fellow before him was named old Sam Kenley. Sam was retired. So Headley come down along with myself and my <coughs> illustrious mother, and we looked over a railroad house that right up here by the crossing. <laughs> and uh, I grew up out here, and I tell you, growing up out in Border was classic. But let me let me get back to the old steam locomotive. That that uh, big locomotive at the time, <laughs> and we had some fun of that old thing. <laughs> It was a Class C oil-fired steam locomotive. The number on that was 1246. It was a 280 wheel configuration. And these things are brutes. But boy, did they have an appetite for, for fuel and uh, water to make that steam. This thing had 63-inch drive wheels that could produce 
43,131 pounds of tractive force. So one of the favorite pastimes out here was to find out just what that converted to. You hook an outhouse up to that and it don't stand a prayer. <laughs> it's God. <laughs> but on a serious note, that locomotive was used to haul freight out of the Blackfoot Valley. And the Milwaukee at the time thought they had a real good thing going. We got this spur line up here, you know, and it's developing and, and we're gonna do all, do all right. So to make this whole thing work, they had a facility. I'm not sure too many people remember. Uh, the old timers, I guess I'm now one of them, these old timers, <laughs> can remember that just past the crossing up here on the left-hand side was a big water tower. This was used to fill that old steam locomotive. And some of the old shays that uh, would bring a load of logs down here, they would fill that water. And uh, later on, I checked to see what this locomotive could use for water. From Bonner to Clearwater Junction to back, that old thing drank 3,000 gallons of water to convert into steam. The fuel consumption, I never did understand it, depended on the, lo or the engineer you were talking to. Uh, some of them just had to have a good head of steam and charge up that canyon, you know, and come back down. But the grade of that canyon is about 3% on that railroad, which means that, uh, what is that, about, she'll raise about three feet for every 100 yards or every 100 feet, somewhere in there. Anyway, to pull up that canyon took, they would take about 16 cars and pull them up there. They were empty. But coming back down, the only thing they had to do because of that grade, and believe me, we found out just what that grade was about. That's a whole other story, and I'll have to have another meeting to tell about that story. But anyway, all that engineer had to do was just maintain enough steam to keep his air system going for the brakes on the cars so they could brake them in the turns. And you didn't want to hit a trestle at a too high a speed at a curve. Or you straight the whole thing out and just dive the whole contraption right down into the river. So this maintenance facility up there that was located just past the railroad tracks uh, had the big oil tower, they had a water tower, and they had a sand house. And that sand house also held spare parts for that locomotive. And uh, just recently, just before I retired, we went up there and found a few of them old discarded parts was laying there. They were uh, grates out of the boiler. Anyway, to, uh, to accommodate the forest fire issue, instead of burning coal or wood that made sparks, this old engine was, uh, was an oil burner. So they had two great big elevated oil tanks that they pumped this crude oil looking stuff. Looked like tar, nasty, nasty stuff. They pump it up into there. That was pumped up in there with uh, uh, steam-driven pumps. They had the pumps were coal-fired uh, off a coal-fired boiler, and produced the steam to, to offload this crude oil up into this tower, and then warm it uh, enough so that it could flow back to the engine tender for fuel. So that whole that whole area up there was. Uh, Boy, that was nasty. Underneath those oil towers where it, it, uh, the oil had dripped and spilled as they filled that old engine, uh, became a collecting area. It looked like the tar pits out of a horror movie. It was full of dead birds and all kinds of stuff. And one of the rites of passages, <laughs> if you had a, a young fellow out here that didn't quite fit, you know, he, he was usually a little bit mouthy or something, he was introduced to that tar pit and the dead birds and everything else that was in there. So uh, I kept my mouth shut. Did help put one fellow in there and his mother, what his mother said to me, well, I would not dare repeat. <laughs> okay, about that time, uh, Bonner went to, went to Hollywood, or Hollywood came to Bonner in the form of Timberjack. This was in the, about 1956. And uh, we had an old steam locomotive sat over here at the mill. Uh, it was decommissioned. 
painted with an army, red army lead paint, which faded into the sun, you know, and it turned pink. To me, that was the biggest insult. That mighty old engine in there, that faithful old machine, was pink. <laughs> I never liked that, but once Timberjack come along, well, boy, they put a new coat of paint on that thing and they patched her up and, and we made us a movie, a pretty good movie. In fact, uh, just recently come across the DVD and we recorded some copies of that old movie. It's kind of a corny plot, but uh, a, a real cool movie. And Parks of Bonner then are shown in that. If you ever have a chance, you know, get that and look at it. It's, it's a great, great movie. Okay, getting back to our locomotives, uh, the old 1246, which we hooked all the outhouses on and tried to test that tractive force, was retired. And it was replaced with a little, what they called, uh, some slang of that was, for those engines were yard donkey or, uh, uh, it was a little diesel electric switch engine, kind of a weird shaped little guy. I think uh, Railink might have one down here that looks similar to that. Uh, they used that for a while and then uh, uh, they went to a general purpose switch engine, which is a lot like what the, a rail link is used out here now. Uh, that general purpose switch was uh, the last one that went up the valley. They went up to Pyramid Mountain to pick up some finished lumber. The number on that, the designated number, that was uh, 282. The other little uh, yard donkey type switch engine, the numbers on that were uh, 1648. And I have some pictures of here of anybody, you know, those old engines that. Uh, you're welcome to look at it if you have the time. Now, those memories of those days were laid to rest. They tore the towers down, they got rid of the sand house and everything. And then that oil came back to haunt us. Came back up through the surface again and we had this this big mess. This happened with Stimson. And they were uh, a little bit alarmed to say the least. They didn't want to clean that mess up. Didn't have a clue where it came from. So I got a hold of a picture of uh, was taken at the time we filmed Timberjack, and in the background, Sterling Hayden standing up there in all his glory with a rifle in his hand, and he's standing up there, and right behind him is that whole complex. We got the oil towers, we got the old pump house down there, we got the sand house, we got all that stuff. So I drug the old picture out and got a hold of uh, Dick Scheimer and, uh, we, and Ed Roberts and Doral Higgy. And we all went up there and, and I pointed that out in, in relation to what it was to what it is when that oil came back up through the surface. And everybody was pretty well relieved. That that was the Milwaukee's baby. Let's throw that in their park. They clean that mess up. So we laid that to rest. Okay, growing up in Bonner, I wanna I wanna I wanna touch on the fact that out here, I don't think Mark Twain and Tom Sawyer, his characters, Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn had any more fun than what we did. Outside of tying up outhouses, uh, I had my first shot of whiskey. And uh, how that came about was we had a fellow over here. His name was Johnny Magnuson. I think probably some of the old divers might remember old Johnny. He was pretty well deaf. But Johnny had a taste for the whiskey. He liked a little dip. After he put in a week at the mill, you know, he was entitled to a dip. Anybody was. <laughs> but Emma didn't. Emma was kind of religious and she didn't think too much of that little nips of whiskey. So what he did was he had a bottle hit out in his woodshed in, in between the, the pieces of firewood. They also uh, were not blessed with children, so they had a little fox terrier dog, which took the place of a child. Now Johnny, towards the end of the week, you know, you could tell he, he kind of licking his lips and rubbing his mouth there. He was wanting to snort. So what he'd do is he turned that dog out. And boy, that dog had hit up the side of Bonner Mountain right over here. 
And Emma, boy, she let out a shriek, crack up her skirts. Johnny, Johnny, the dogs got out. Up the mouth she went. Johnny says, be right with you, Emma. <laughs> Go out the back door into the woodshed, take a snort. Put the bottle back away and up the bottom you go. Well, they get the dog back and, and we watched this and thought, I wonder what whiskey really tastes like, you know. Let's let's go out and have us a sample. So the next time that happened, why Johnny went up the bottom, we went straight to the woodshed, took our belt. I liked it, died right on the spot. Didn't think I was gonna get out of the woodshed before they got back. <laughs> Also, as, as kids out here, uh, I learned to smoke, smoke a cigarette. That was about the coolest thing I could ever imagine was to, was to you know, smoke like the old timers did, you know. So somebody heisted a can of Velvet pipe tobacco. We couldn't find any paper, so we got a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> we rolled up this cigarette that I'll tell you, <laughs> it was a big old thing, like about a cigar. Lit that thing up, took a puff, the paper all burnt off, and here's all these sparks down your neck, and oh man, we, we about burned our fort down. I mean, <laughs> this was bad stuff. How in the heck can anybody do that? You know, the smoke in your face, and you're strangling and coughing. And so. This was growing up in water. This was a great place. And I'm sure the surrounding areas, Milltown and uh, West Riverside, they, they, I think they called it the flat then, uh, was great places. We didn't have TV or anything, so we had to use our own imaginations. And boy, did we come up with some dandy stuff. Okay. That 10 year period or 11 years was uh, drawn to a close. I was getting to be a little bit older and uh, Looking over here at this mill, I thought, this is going to be a cool place to work. I know all these guys over here. They're, like Art said, they were some of the finest folks out here that you would ever care to meet. They were hardworking, uh, religious. Uh, you just couldn't ask for a better place to work. So on August 8th of 1960, I you know, got a hold of Yum Karkin, and he got a hold of me because it seems like I was always getting crossways with him. <laughs> and he decided the best way to keep tabs on me was put me to work over here. So he says, come on down, we'll get you a job. And my first job was on the green chain, night shift, 12-foot station. Bob Club was the supervisor. And boy, did I have an upcoming on that green chain. I'll tell you what, as, as Cal said on, on, that, on that gang saw, we had one fellow that liked to back all them cats up and run them through all at once. And what was it, nine cuts that thing could make? Well, you could make a <clears throat> number of cuts. Yeah. And not only that, they, some of them guys would stack several cans on top of each other. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they, they'd get pretty good at them. Boy, yeah. there would be a pile of them. Oh, they'd come out there like a deck of cards. And you had to pull this stuff off and put it in a pile. And them guys up in the sawmill just thinking that's just the funniest thing they ever saw. <laughs> Killed us off down there. So one day I sniveled, and boy, Bonner was a place you did not snivel at. There was a fellow there named Anton Iverson. I, one time he became our union president. <laughs> he looked at me and he says, this is where the men work. If you can't stand the pace, go home to your mommy. <laughs> I didn't need to hear that. So I bucked up and I went to work. And by damn, you were expected, you know, an honest day's work for an honest day's pay, and they expected that. Okay, about this time, our President Kennedy and old Nikita Khrushchev were really mixing it up over there in Cuba. And I was in the National Guard at the time, and uh, I was with the 154th Field Artillery Group. And of all damn things, a nuclear war. We were put on uh, an alert. We had to load our equipment on the trains and we were getting ready to go. And thank God we didn't have to pry those Russians out of Cuba. <laughs> they finally went away. But that, that meant that being as I was in the National Guard, I could no longer work night shift. I had to train out at Fort Missoula nights for this possible Cuba thing. So I had, to, I had to take a day shift job. At that point, 
I went from the green chain, which really didn't hurt my feelings that bad, at least I thought, to the dry chain. And again, a lot of lumber come out that dry chain. Hurts right here in the audience. Arnie little bugger, he was a grader over there. <laughs> and boy, could, could they, if he wanted, he'd look down there and see what station he was pulling, and that chalk of his made the grade that you had to pull. And you pulled till your tongue hung on the ground. <laughs> Well, he had a big laugh up in there. <laughs> so, <laughs> I survived that until it came time to, uh, this new building was being built. This big square one on the corner. Cal made mention of that. And uh, we had a big ceremony out here. Uh, the governor come in with a helicopter and we had speeches and a picnic and, and uh, some of the guys down on the green chain wore neckties and a white shirt, which, you know, kind of raised a few eyebrows, but whoever really killed it was somebody made a sign for the public, which was invited to, to uh, tour the plant. They made a sign saying, please do not feed the animals. <laughs> that did not set at all, you know, the sign come down. But anyway, here we are with this brand new building, and boy, I tell you, compared to what we had, this was something. Rudy mentions the cold. We had steam heat in there, rotating heaters. First year or two, it was great. After that, the vibration of the building and everything made those heaters so they wouldn't work. And there was, for some reason, we always had cold water running through them in the dead of winter. <laughs> And in the middle of summer, they get around to put the steam to them. <laughs> but we managed to survive all that. And uh, we run that plant until, uh, oh boy, about the early 70s, about 72, when uh, U.S. Plywood come in and bought, bought the whole outfit, lock, stock, and barrel. We were out of work. Cal mentioned. Uh, what he was doing during that transition time. Uh, I was, uh, I'd taken on several mechanics jobs. I had a little shop in East Missoula. So I had enough work to keep me going and then all of a sudden we got a call from U.S. Plywood. We need you back here, we wanna get this plant going. You know, so I came back in and uh, uh, as I had worked in the planer, you know, I had most all jobs except graders. I never did get one of them great jobs. These guys over here, they kind of they kind of hoarded that job. But uh, I was in maintenance at the time, and of course U.S. Plywood wanted anything to do with maintenance. Get them back here. We want this plant running. And I was hired back right off the bat and got a pretty good seniority number. It was pretty high up. So I felt real good about that. And uh, I was on night shift again at the time, and then I had to... Uh, uh, if I stayed in maintenance, it, I would have to stay on the night shift. I didn't want to do that. I wanted a job that really rang my bell of uh, being an overhead crane operator. And the top of this big square building was, was three overhead cranes. Those monsters weighed 65 ton each. And you sat up there in your own little world, and it, it was a cool job. I mean, you, you could sit down. Uh, Al. He run the crane right next to me for years. Uh, we run those things for over 20 years. And then we're sold out again. Doggone it. They, they, uh, well, we weren't sold out. We were, we were shut down for a rebuild. And I have a lot of pictures of that rebuild in my album here, if you want to see that. And uh, during that rebuild, boy, they cut the roof out of the sawmill, and they tore down this, and they tore down that. And... Uh, remodel that mill to take on the studs and it's pretty much what we have over here now. I worked for a while as Art mentioned as safety became a real big issue here. Uh, I worked with Champion in the safety department and when it came to build this new plant boy they were hammering that safety something fierce. And, and Al worked with me on this too. Together we worked on that safety. We wanted to be able to not actually show an individual how that machine run as far as the hand and eye coordination goes and what makes a good operator 
and whatnot. We wanted to show them basically how they were turned on, how you disabled the power to them in the case of making an adjustment or things like that, just the basic safety issues. That title was called, uh, we were safety trainers, and we stayed in that position until about 1993 when uh, they sold the whole operation to the Stimson Lumber Company. At that time, I had to reply for a job. Uh, the gravy job of being the safety trainer was definitely out the window. It was back to old Tony and, uh, you know, this is where the men work. So, uh, I went back to work as a precision end trimmer operator, but still, Stimson liked to get the most bang for the buck they could out of any guy. If you had one job, here, have this one, and, and by the way, we need you on this committee and that committee and the other committee. And uh, I figured, well, I'm reaching the end of the road. I'm, I'm an old timer now. I'm getting gray around the edges. Hair is falling out. I'm getting ready to retire. So I think I can put up with this. So in about uh, the summer of 2005, I retired. Yeah, they give me a cake, and they, I got a little plaque thing in here, you know, and all the goodies going with retirement. Had a, had a great time there. Said goodbye to all my fellow workers, and I was out the door. Uh, my time period at Bonner, I lived in the town, like I said, for 11 years, and I worked in the mill for 45. Seen a lot of changes come down. A lot of, I worked with a lot of good people. Uh, but before, I, before I, I, I end my my part of this, one thing I wanted to 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 show everyone was uh, the old Hotel Margaret. It was a beautiful old building, and there's a song that's out on the country western charts right now. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, the the singers. Some of his lyrics were, you should have seen it in color. You should have been there in color. So what I did, it was always a, a, something I wanted to do, was I colorized that old hotel as, as to what I remember it being. And I'll have this picture available here. Uh, you'll notice uh, <laughs> rough and tumble sawmill. You'll notice some pink curtains in here. They had not part of rough and tumble, you know, and tobacco chewing and swearing and all that. But what they were put in there for was uh, the mill manager at the, that time. His name Jack Root. He had two daughters, Dorothy Laird. They called her Dottie Laird. She lived over here on Central Avenue for a while. And he had an older daughter named Madge. Well, Madge would come to visit, and she would stay in the tower room of this old hotel. And she wanted something more feminine, other than, you know, smoke-stained curtains and stuff like that. So her and her mother, her mother's name was Eve, Eva, went down, and they got these kind of pinkish curtains. They're not as harsh a pink as what I put into the picture. But uh, it's just so that when I tell this story, I can say the pink curtains there was because of, of Madge. But as I, as I talked to uh, various people on this old building, and it was a magnificent old building. We, everybody had their own ideas. It should have been a bed and breakfast, or it should have been this and that and the other. Sue Hogan and I spent the most time talking about this. She wanted a gift shop. And of course, I graciously conceded, yeah, you have your gift shop in there, but you know, we can, we can have a bed and breakfast and all that. You know, we can do all these fancy things with this old building. Unfortunately, it was torn down due to taxes and, and upkeep and the heating of it and all that. Uh, prompted them to shut it down, but it, I always wanted to colorize this and make it available to anyone who would want to see that as I remembered it. And, and this meeting here was a great time for me to, to be able to show this. So I thank everyone for putting up with me for this brief period, and, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> if anybody has any questions, uh, they can certainly ask questions in the panel. Right. Any questions for Art? You worked in wood the same time I did. You didn't tell them about your truck wreck. I didn't want to bring that up. <laughs>
Oh, it was cold. Yeah, it was cold. Road, I didn't go off the road. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking the question. <laughs> there was a lot of those stories that could be told, believe me. Uh, I got to tell you, Juan, I was hauling out of Gold Creek uh, in, in the younger years, and I came around the corner, and this, this logging truck was sitting in the road. No driver around. I was just sitting there running. Was that Keith? No. no. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't Keith. And uh, uh, what had happened was this, this truck was getting away from this driver, and he, he put it into the ditch on the inside, which was fairly deep, and it held the truck, and then he bailed out. <laughs> and the truck went down around the corner and stopped. And I happened to come up and he stuck to, uh, I don't remember who was driving that truck at the time. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. <laughs> A lot of stories that go on. Well, one thing I, I don't think we mentioned uh, that's probably important, not only was this the largest plywood plant in North America, which it was, uh, by volume. Also, uh, one thing that I don't think, I, I think Cal hit a little bit on it, was the double end auger that was put in at the time. And I know Cal can fill you in more than I can on that. But that was one of a kind, one of the first, by the way. And uh, for those of you that don't know what a double end auger is or, or, or uh, have no idea, it squared three sides of the log, being the bottom and the sides. And, and a, a double end auger was picking up a log as this one's going out. And then they came back this way and this one's picking up a log going out. And, and it kept that up all day long. Now if you can imagine this thing cut a log every four seconds. Every four seconds there was a log. Not only did it cut that log, and again, Cal, I'm sure you fill you in on this better than I can, but it was called, there was an optimizer on this machine. What the optimizer did was actually x-rayed that log. It actually x-rayed it before it went into the, to the, the machine and centered the machine to get the most productivity out of that log that it could including uh, various items of defect inside the log, uh, the curve of the log, so forth. That optimizer would take a picture of that that fast and run that log to get the most material out of that. Is that about what That's it That's about right, yeah. It, it was totally amazing to sit there and watch on the screen. And they had a screen in the lunchrooms. And this screen would show you the next log that was about to come up. Not only did it show you that log, it would tell you what they were going to cut out of that log, what widths, what uh, uh, different variations of that log, also to get away from whatever kind of defect was in that log. What an amazing piece of history and technology there. It's too bad that, in fact, I think I do have a film at home that I would be more than willing to donate that those of you who would like to see that. It's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, but that thing, that thing there is hardly ever ran. <laughs> <laughs> it, when it ran, it was... Uh, I noticed it kept you fellas busy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's, a, that's another one that came into play there when... Uh, and these fellas uh, well know that better than I do, and Rudy. Uh, when the lumber was put into the dry kiln and graded, that lumber was going through that through the dry kill so fast that they had to actually put a belt behind that to slow that down. Is that not right, Rudy? They, they had to slow it down. I mean, it was like a bullet coming out of this thing and, and very dangerous. So they, they had to slow it back down. So Because, you know, these guys weren't really working real hard. They had to <laughs> Yeah, you were. <laughs> <laughs> well, U.S. Plywood and Champion, they like quality. They want a real good and put paper on the lumber and make it so the time the customer bought, there was no dirt or any flaws on it. And as time went on, we got a different boss, and he didn't think he should have small packs. Supervisors. <laughs> Supervisors. <laughs> yeah, bosses. So he should have a, you should put this thing out, just get it through, and that customer will never see you. You don't know him, you don't know that. And that started putting everything down. He lowered the grade so bad that we finally just had to stop and have a meeting. And he said, just go back to the old way that you graded lumber. Forget what I told you. 
and uh, but it was a quality product and they would come from Japan and all over to see our lumber because that's what they wanted it. They knew if they bought one pack of lumber, the quality was so good the next one would be exactly the same. And I think <clears throat> I think that's what really kind of happened to the mail. They wanted a lower product all the time and just get it out. We were putting out probably 200,000 a shift. After a while they wanted 300 and then it's after I left, 2,000. They said sometimes they hit almost 400,000. And they just flooded the market, and we got all these houses out there now that they can't sell. And that's what everybody does. They just keep putting this product out there. Finally, you got a glut on the market, and these mills are down. This mill, I think, if they'd never built a plywood mill, would still be going today. But they, like Art said, of how many logs it takes. And with the environmentalists wanting all these, preserve these trees, we'll never see that again in our lifetime and even if we do they won't let you cut it so it's uh it's a combination of things that put this mill down i think they could still be cutting the logs out there if they selectively cut thank you um, i'm a newcomer to bonner a firm of so to speak grew up in missoula but have been out here um, for the history aspect of it and got to take a tour of part of the plant, and in the old stone building, there are kind of notes from history all over the beams upstairs, um, which was just fascinating to me. One name that got a lot of board feet on the beam was Amy, I think. Who was what? Amy, I think was the name that repeated itself, or people repeated the name Amy in some context. Or other. Does anybody know who Amy was, or why she really so many board feet of historical <laughs> 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 Keith, do you remember? <laughs> I didn't write it. No. <laughs> Rick, do you remember who that was? No, I don't. I rem don't remember a name. Name. Amy. 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 It w wasn't an N in front of it, was it? I don't think so. Because might, might be fun to, for everybody to go back and look. Yeah. <laughs> Namey <laughs> was an old timer up there, but I don't. I didn't uh, recognize the name Amy. Yeah. Oh. Speaking of that old stone building for which he was in, there I is, the name wrong. I don't know if I can find it on this map, there's, a, there's an old water well somewhere, I, let's see, somewhere between the, the main shop and here, that, that old water well was, it, it amazed me because it's probably three to four foot in diameter, about 80 feet deep, and that well is rocked all the way to the bottom. Now, I, I just amazed, how do you go about that? How do you dig a hole in rock and going down, I guess, is <laughs> what I couldn't understand. <laughs> yeah, it's a very good water well, and it, it's actually on the historical records now. But it totally amazed me that, that they had the technology, or I don't know how they did that. I, I wouldn't be able to do that today. Were there any other questions? Anybody? I just put a side note out there. Very interesting to have that good a job. They <laughs> were pumping out so much lumber. You guys, I was one of the last ones to go out. And you and your knuckles were hitting boards constantly. They were running 400,000 shit nonstop. The sawmills were just shit. I, shit. I can tell you a story one time. I probably shouldn't bring this up at the time, but. We were working in a log yard and we had this bee tree come in, big pine. And uh, we thought it'd be we thought it'd be pretty funny to send that through the sawmill. So we plugged up the hole at night with some mud. Everything went well and we threw it in the pond and lo and behold that hit the pond the next day and they sliced that tree open and they had to evacuate the sawmill and we were never allowed to tell anybody about that problem. We probably wouldn't have been there very long now. That opened up a whole new can of worms, I'll tell you. No more bee trees going in that mill. Pretty mad sawyers. Yeah, I think some fellow set up a... Does anybody in the audience have stories they'd like to tell about the mill? Well, you did, we didn't mention about the log mill, a uh, small log mill. No, no, we mentioned that. The ones that made the post caps and girts for the 
and the ladders for the uh, my, mines in Butte. Excuse me, um, may I interrupt and invite you to the microphone so that uh, MCAT won't be I showing? I don't have that much. Uh, <laughs> please do, though. These stories, and you'll be a good example for others to, to do the same. The small log mill was just west, no, it would be uh, east, wouldn't it? East of the sawmill before they had that tore down. But uh, they made small timbers for the mines in Butte. They called them caps, uh, girts, and posts. And uh, when I worked down there on the... Uh, small log mill they had uh, a chain that was also the uh, part that uh, they made lumber beside the put the posts and uh, the uh, were loaded into bundles the forklift would pick them up as it came out and they would stack them in piles out in the yard from there, it was taken to the flat cars that were down there. There was seven or eight of them at one day. Each day they had that many. And they were, we were loaded, and I went, my job was to tie the, the posts that were put in the side, make sure that they didn't flop to the side. You know, there were two by sixes that you shoved in the pockets. And then you tied the tops and you banded the ends and uh, we did eight of those a day. And uh, also, if I remember right, that was uh, after, because the sawmill had some down there by the machine shop. Remember, we loaded cars there too. Mm -hmm. And also, piggybacks, they, NP would come in and uh, load up their trailers and then that was my job to tie those the same way. But uh, that was very interesting, especially when it was like you say, uh, 20, 30 below zero with that Hellgate wind down to there. And uh, it was uh, very interesting. I remember uh, Frank Kurth, I don't know if you remember him or not, but uh, we worked together many days down there in that. And, uh, but uh, that's about all I have to, I didn't even think about that until just now. <laughs> you know, a story I remember about that, uh, Rick's crew down there in the stall mill was, I was on a green chain and uh, of course I shouldn't say this, it means I pushed safety so many years, but we had some great snowball fights at first snow with those guys. Somebody would holler down there, you know, stall mill, Sucks and boy, I tell you, the air was full of snowballs. <laughs> One particular time, we had a fellow named Mutt Tag made a great big pile of snowballs, and he was all ready. He stepped off another the green chain mouth off to the stone mill crew. He was going to step back in and get his snowballs, you know, to get ready for this fight. He ran back underneath the green chain and right smack into a steam pipe, and laid him out colder than a wedge. <laughs> <laughs> Well, those those are some of the good old days and something that a safety guy never talks about. Yeah. <laughs> you talk about <clears throat> how cold it was out there when the bull chain would come out of the pond, you know, taking logs in the mill. Of course, the logs were wet and they'd drip water. And so this would, this bull chain would form icicles on it. And it would just come completely covered in ice. So one day, one, it was, I think it was around January, darn chain it jumps off the return track you know to his return to the pond and when it jumped off it hit the framework and just tore everything out I mean there was just a mangled up mess of steel and it was like 20 and 30 below out there and the wind was blowing and, and of course those maintenance people was our job we had to get out there and fix that thing so you'd go out there you know so darn cold we'd work in shifts a couple guys would go out and we'd get on the welders and we'd cut and weld that thing and put it back together and you could only be out there 15, 20 minutes, and you'd have to go back inside and get it warmed up, and somebody else would come out and relieve you, and you'd get in there, get yourself all warmed up again, and pretty quick, 
15, 20 minutes later, it's your turn to go again. <laughs> and it continued and we finally got it fixed. And it was about two days later, the same thing happened. The darn thing jumped the chain and tore everything out again. Well, then we finally smartened up and put a guy out there with a long pole and was breaking that ice off of there, getting rid of it before that could happen to us. But there were some times when, on, when that wind coming out of that Blackfoot, you could not hardly stand it out there. We was working on a hydraulic pump on a loader one time and it was so cold out there. Me and my friend was working on this pump and we had to change pumps and he looked at me and said, you better get in there. He said, your cheek is getting all white. And sure enough, I was getting all frostbitten and everything. So went in there and get warmed up again. But we had a lot of times like that, you know. And winter, and I don't know, the winter just seemed colder then. I think Maybe the global warming is taking effect. <laughs> And you know, a lot of times when, when the millwrights didn't want some of these tougher jobs, they pawned them off onto some of the rest of us. And I can, re I can well remember the time when we were sawing the ice off the dam down there with power saws. Well, these maintenance people were inside drinking coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Probably Very was hurt. 40 below weather. Do you remember that, Glenn? Did yeah. you get in on any yeah. of that? And you can count old Gene Hurts been yeah. down there drinking coffee right along with him and sit him up there and drink. <laughs> <laughs> we had to cut the ice off from behind the dam to relieve the water pressure because the, the ice would build up so thick that the water forming underneath had no place to go other than putting pressure against the dam. So we would go out there with chainsaws tied off with a rope. We were, we were very safety conscious. <laughs> and, uh, and we would cut back probably four, six, eight feet uh, behind the dam to relieve that water pressure. And like I said, you didn't get much help out of millwrights. That wasn't their duties. <laughs> Can't blame them. No, we suffered plenty. <laughs> we, when the mill would uh, in that cold period in, inside the mill, the mill was also cold. There wasn't any heaters or anything in there. And so the, the night shift, would they'd get off about 3 in the morning, you know. And so we did dare shut the machinery off. We had to leave it run all night. Otherwise, in the morning, if we stopped it, it would freeze up. We couldn't get started the next morning. So we just let it run until the weather changed. It never did stop. I think we did that. Also in the logging, uh, probably Keith can remember, uh, during the real cold times in 30, 40, 50 below weather, uh, we'd let the, the equipment run all night long. They would have a crew that would check on them. The dozers would freeze to the ground so hard that it would break the final drives out of them. And so they would run them up on logs and leave them set on the logs overnight and leave them running. And, and we'd have a crew go out and fuel them up and make sure that they were still running. I don't know. If, did you ever get into any of that? On, on, uh, Watching the equipment at night when we left them running. No, I never got in on any of that. Yeah, I got in on some of that. Yeah, I was talking about logging equipment. Yeah, that's what I'm. Yeah, oh, that's I what I'm logging that. equipment. Yeah. It would freeze so hard. The dozers would freeze so hard to the ground that it would break the fine grass. Anybody else have anything? Yeah, I got one thing. Uh, you're talking about your low wages, how much we were getting paid an hour. <laughs> the credit union was out there too and uh, when I started in 58 and I wasn't there more than do I have to get up? Yes. <laughs> uh, get up here God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah now you've done it. <laughs> you know the rules. Yeah you were good at taking trips. You know, my little buddy over there, you know. <laughs> him and I, we worked together there, side by side there for 25, 30 years. <laughs> and, uh, and he would always say, that doggone Hertz is off doing credit union again. <laughs> and uh, and I, when I just barely got started, then they, they needed somebody to t run, run the credit union. And I thought, well, I'll put my wife to work. She's at home. And we had a whole bunch of little ones. As a matter of fact, the wife and I, we had seven children. So anyway, there, I thought, well, I put her to work, and, the, and I would work the mail. And I would get these guys to throw in their quarters and dollars, what few dollars they had. 
so that we could run the credit union, so we could make loans to one another. And, the, and this one, uh, this went on, the credit union got a little bigger, and I had the credit union in my house for 15 years. Never charged them rent, never. <laughs> yeah, so we could have enough money there to loan out. And uh, all, all the while there, that the, 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 my kids kept coming, kept coming, and, and Odegaard, you remember Arno Odegaard, he was our little auditor. He would audit the books all the time, and uh, and uh, the kids, the kids would run run around, run around the house, and and uh, the first thing you know, the the kids were supposed to go to bed, and they wouldn't go to bed, and Odie Odie just kept coaxing them, and mother was getting madder, <laughs> and uh, then the credit union was was taking up all my time. So when I got these guys to sign up to the credit union there, in order to, for the credit union to save money, at statement time, uh, we hand out the statement every quarter, I would go around and I see all these guys. And uh, I think at one time there, I, I must have knew two thirds of the guys that worked at the mill. I knew them all by name. And I also knew how much money they had. <laughs> it was a lot more than I had. <laughs> yeah, I, I even got Art, Art Bailey over there. I got him in the credit union too there. I had him there. Cal Bonnet here, he was a little harder to get in, but I, I finally got him. I was in there for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember going to the yeah. And I was yeah. on the committee that had to uh, evaluate people that wanted loans yeah. and yeah. so I had to know their background and their credit history and stuff and I just didn't like that type of thing to know what people's <laughs> business was I got the heck out of there. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Willis says, says uh, that I'm supposed to tell you my name but uh, everybody knows my name because uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, because uh, cause I, I worked with the credit union a, a long time. I, I served on the board of directors for the credit union for 21 years. I, I literally uh, supervised it, ran it, and with all the help of these guys that volunteered to, to work on the credit committee and the board of directors and all that stuff. and. The, if you see this one person that I know real well, he's a dear friend of mine, and uh, we needed the president of the board uh, for the credit union. Nobody wanted to be president, even though I was treasurer. So what happened one night, we was having a meeting in the basement of my house, and, uh, and nobody wanted to be president. And one guy, one guy happened to excuse himself to go go to the bathroom and when he came back he was president <laughs> he, he 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 never he never forgive me that uh, he, he thought I was behind it all but it, but I was I was the instigator of a lot of stuff you know but these but these uh, but these guys out at the mill they they were thrifty people and they, they knew how to handle their money, and they, they borrowed a little, but they were always the good payers. And, and then we hardly ever lost the loan, hardly. Once in a while we did, but most of the time they, they were good, conscientious, hard-working people. Thank you. <laughs> you know that you know that planer that after they made that conversion that one planer there that was fed with rubber tires that was uh, uh, Newman wasn't it yeah, yeah. Newman, you know Plinus and I my little buddy here him and I graded behind that 
and that damn thing would never break down. <laughs> and then the one that Miller was on over there, that thing was always down. <laughs> and, and Glennis and I there, we were turning boards two at a time, and between the, uh, the, the two of us there, Oh, we graded two thirds of the lumber day. <laughs> it only seemed like them. <laughs> yeah, and that was that was a used uh, planer. We went uh, right. we went to Ken McMillan. I don't know if you remember Ken. We went to uh, Georgia, and the champion owned it at Mill in Georgia. Yeah, and we went down to Georgia and looked at it to see if it was something we could utilize in the new mill. And it was, and then that's how it got here. We went down. So you was the instigator. Yeah, I'm one of the reasons it got here. <laughs> I know. I, <laughs> I never would admit it till now. <laughs> My name's Keith Lurback, and I thought I'd give you a little history too. Uh, I, I was one of your credit union guys, and I remember that I was down in your basement, and he had the most beautiful naughty pine basement. <laughs> and uh, I wonder where all that came from. <laughs> a piece at a time. It's like the guy with the Cadillac, you know, a piece at a time. Yeah. <laughs> it really was nice. <laughs> it's still naughty pine, yes. Still in the same house, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I started about the same time Max, a little before him in 1960. Of course, my dad started in 49 or 50 and worked there until about 1960, I guess, or 61, something like that. But I worked there in the box factory, did a lot of the jobs that uh, a lot of these guys did here, and uh, making all them different things, the letters for the mine and all these different things. And then I, and then I got a job, uh, they wanted to train some electricians. So I got into that. And I was doing pretty good. I got shocked pretty good a few times, but I was still alive. I got across 440 one time, that knocked me on the butt. But anyway, uh, then we had this efficiency expert, we called him a headhunter, came through. And he started going through and telling the company where they could cut all the jobs and stuff and make money, so I lost my electrician job. And so I transferred into the woods in, I think, about 66. And uh, it's not like it is today, I'll tell you. Uh, back then, I was a choker setter, and I rode on a cat with a cat skinner. And we'd go up the mountain, we'd bring the logs in. They were brought in tree links at that time. And they had a big landing, and they had like two buckers on the landing. They'd buck it up, and, and uh, then they'd load them on the trucks, put them in the decks and stuff. But anyway, I was uh, always wanted to be a truck driver, never been a truck driver, but that was my goal, so... Ron Bailey, I got finally got a job after about a year choke setting. I got a job to train to buy to drive a logging truck, and Ron Bailey took me up and had me one trip. And he says, "Now it's yours." And so, I guess you know, I had a lot of fun for a couple of days there trying to figure out how to shift that thing. <laughs> you know, had a five-speed main box and four-speed Brownie, and you had to try and figure all these things out. But anyway, uh, from then on. Uh, uh, I got I got into the logging business and I drove for Lart Cook, W.A. Cook. He was the contractor at that time, had the, all the trucks at the camp up there. And uh, Al Dawson was the woods supervisor and Art Cook was the, owned the trucks. So they both liked their little hooch too. <laughs> and invariably somebody would be stopping you on the road. We wasn't allowed to have radio, so we had no contact. We, you had to drive by looking across the corner and seeing where the dust was of another truck coming down. That's... That's why Art Bailey got in a wreck. He couldn't see the dust. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, every once in a while, somebody stopped you on the road and say, hey, uh, Art or Al or both of them are down there in the ditch. You got to stop and pull them out. And invariably, they would uh, they couldn't quite handle the road, and they'd be off in the ditch someplace. I remember one time I was hauling the right away out of uh, old Potter's place up there on that Sunset Road, and it was nothing but a gumbo mess. You couldn't keep a truck on the road if you tried. So <laughs> I come down there one time with a load of logs, and my trailer slipped off in the ditch, and over it went, and there I sat. Old Art Cook come up, and he chewed my butt off, and he went up the road about 100 yards, and he was in the ditch. <laughs> so, but anyway, the logging really changed. It was uh, quite an experience then, and then, of course, Anaconda took it over, and, and that, when they sold out, I 
never did go back there except for just a short time, and and uh, I worked a lot of different jobs and and wound up uh, driving the later years for a couple of the guys part time. But uh, the logging industry had really changed from then because it uh, it was just a a great big crew that would go up in the bus in the morning and you'd stay there all day and they had a big oil bus they called the oil bus and that's where you ate your lunch and stuff. Uh, not Bumper, he'd be the one to be in there or getting the fire going so everybody'd be warm while they're eating their lunch and stuff. But now it's of course it's changed. Everybody's got their own rigs and everybody's got brand new rigs and brand new loading equipment and it's uh, quite a thing. So anyway, that's my history. I never did have any wrecks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I might add to that. Uh, Ed Roberts uh, sent me up there on assignment. I was writing a, a little article for the Tamarack newsletter, and he says you need to jump into one of these drivers and, and spend a day with them, see what they do. So I thought, boy, I know Keith. He's my brother-in-law. I got an inside track here. Jumped in with Keith, and some of them roads you guys drove was something else. And I remember asking Keith, I says, how in the hell do you get a load of logs down a road like this? And he told me, he says, you just point that radiator cap downhill and the rest of it's going to follow. <laughs> <laughs> how in the devil these guys could pull that off was beyond me, but they did. Did a hell of a job at it, too. <laughs> I still think I got white knuckle marks, you know, that seat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you a story about Al Dawson. Al Dawson was a supervisor for the logging department. A big burly husky. One of these guys with a with an axe handle in his hand. And, and uh, went up to the office one morning, and there was two guys there, and he just got done firing them. And uh, there was two other fellows looking for a job, sawing in the woods there, standing beside him, and he said. If you two guys are going to stand around here, you just will pick up your tools and get out too. And he fired both of them before he even hired them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it was back then. <laughs> I, I really liked the man, though. He, he, he was well respected, but uh, you didn't cross him either. <laughs> you know, that gentleman over there, he was talking about. The, the pine in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> I have to I have to let you in on it. I was I graded on the pattern machine. The <clears throat> pattern machine made patterns on boards, and uh, and um, I I was the last one to look at it before we bundled it up and shipped it off. Well, anyway, any board that would come through there. Uh, that I kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> it is it, 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 it took a little route. <laughs> and you were talking about the cedar cedar two by fours and stuff. Right here. His house is full of cedar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of them. <laughs> I got a lot of them. But if you ever get uh, ever get a chance to come to my house. My, my basement has got this paneling in it. And in, this, in these boards, there was very few of them there. It was hard to get. They had little black eye, black, black dots in them, in the pie. Bird's eye. Bird yeah. eye. They call it, we called it bird's eye pie. My basement is boarded with that. Wow. Yeah, it really looks nice. Oh, boy. <laughs> but it, it was all hand picked. I, I'm, I'm guilty. <laughs> How long did it take you to get it? Oh, a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you know, when it comes to the lumber deals like that. There's one fellow we should have made mention to, and his name was Lefty Pleasant. <laughs> you know, if the world had 6,000 more Lefty Pleasants, it would be a great place to live. He helped the mill worker out, my God. If you wanted wood, see Lefty, you got to buy that just wouldn't quit. You know, what a great individual that man was. How about 
probably take it. You're talking about my <laughs> I've mean, never seen him not without a smile. Yeah, he was always up to some kind of issue, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, I remember as a kid, our mutt was mutt was uh, grading out. We had the Victory Gardens. Remember down by by the mill, right where that stone mill sat. We had these Victory Gardens. Uh, you could rent a plot of ground in there and raise a garden, whatever you wanted. Well, when the stone mill come along, those were to be bulldozed out of there. So the fad in Bonner at that time was these flipper slingshots. And the ammunition was mountain ash berries. And here's Mutt down there, the road maintainer. He's grading that log yard out. He's concentrating on that. <laughs> and we zinged the mountain ash berry through that cab. <laughs> he looked up and seen who it was. That man can run. <laughs> you know, he chased us halfway up the side of the mountain here. <laughs> Last time we ever shot a mountain Ashbury, old mutt. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's been wonderful being here. I'm kind of getting thirsty for some coffee and a cookie, so if there isn't anything else, Thank you so much. This has been a joy and uh, really uh, welcome you to the ranks of the old timers because you certainly have earned it with your wonderful stories. And um, even though I can't believe that um, any of us are really in that category, but um, once again, I've got my list this time. I'd like to um, again thank um, the Bonner School, St. Anne's Church, Friends of Two Rivers, MCAT, the Rural Fire Department, uh, DEQ, the Blackfoot Land and Water Company for making this all possible, and especially our panel, and especially all of you who have come to share today because um, it's really a significant day, I think. We will try to get the word out to you when this is going to be aired on MCAT, and it'll take some editing, and as soon as we find out when it will be on, we'll get our list there and uh, get the word out. So. You can uh, get your tapes ready and tape yourself. Um, one other thing I would like to mention, um, some of you have brought pictures. Jim Willis just the other day brought um, some pictures that he had found um, in, in a box in his house that had wonderful pictures from the 1920s in the mill. And I know a lot of you um, also have materials that you perhaps would like to share. Uh, the University of Montana Archives will accept these digital copies. You can keep your originals, uh, and they would be used for his um, educational purposes, uh, not commercial purposes. So if any of you are interested in that, let me know or let Jim know, and he can put us in touch um, so that these things can, can be safe because they are truly a gem. So I believe, as uh, Art said, we have goodies, we have coffee, we've got pictures to look at, and more stories to tell. So thank you very much.